stand with me, if you will. We're in uh, looking at Luke 15, beginning in verse, uh, I'm going to begin reading in verse uh, 21 this morning as this young prodigal son has been away and now he has come back to his father. Luke 15, verse 21, and the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was a lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Father, we thank you for this uh, glorious passage of scripture. And as we um, come this morning to consider one more time the great characteristics of God our Father that are represented here. I pray that you will not just teach us, but that you will, that you will bring these things deep into our hearts, Father, and cause us to be changed because we understand you better, because we know you better, because we have just a better, a little better glimpse of what you've done already and what you are doing on our behalf on a daily basis. Thank you for these uh, new uh, signs of life, this new birth that's happened this week, for those that are coming soon, for the marriages that we've seen in the last few weeks. Lord, all of our young people who are growing up, we pray for them. They are facing father temptations. They are facing worldviews that are foreign to some of us. It's just a different world now. And we pray that you will cause them to be young people who are not just having facts that get into them, but whose hearts have been touched and changed by the transforming power of our Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that diligently and with all of the emphasis that I know to bring to it. We pray for that. We pray that you'll call them into various areas of ministry, whether it's secular or sacred, doesn't matter, but that they will know this is the mission of their life. And they will follow you. Bless us now as we approach this passage of Scripture, Father, with the fear and trembling that's appropriate as we come on the holy ground of the Lord who has created us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated and uh, turn with me to Luke 15 if you have not already. Good housekeeping in 1991. There was a, uh, an interview with Oprah Winfrey. And one of the things that, was, that she was quoted as saying in that interview was she said, I didn't feel worth anything and certainly not worthy of love unless I was accomplishing something. I suddenly realized that I have never felt I could be loved just for being. You know, I think that represents the way a lot of people feel. Perhaps there are many here this morning who, if you don't feel that way now, you have certainly been there. And it's a constant, really, reinforcement that comes into our life. I'm not really worthy. I can't be loved unless I am accomplishing something, unless I'm doing something. I must earn my way. And there's a certain truth to that in the life in which we live. And yet, and yet, we need to learn, beloved, that our, that our duty and that our responsibility and the things that we do need to come out of a heart of love, not to try and produce love. This is what this passage is trying to teach us. Religion teaches us that we must be doing something to be right with God. That if we are going to be in a place where we can answer to God and earn God's approval, it must be something we've earned. There is no larger lie in life than that. Satan uses that same lie over and over. We're like the young man who got his plumber's license, you know, and he was feeling quite ambitious because he now had a trade and he had something that he could do that not just everybody could do. Took his young wife out to see Niagara Falls on some, you know, second honeymoon or something. He took one look at Niagara Falls and he says, I think I can fix that. Um, this is how he was feeling because he now had that plumber's license in his hand. Listen. He had no more chance of fixing Niagara Falls than you have of earning your way to God. It's not possible. We can only accept what God has given and what God will give. No well-intentioned effort could ever meet the requirements of a perfect God. But here's the good, good, good news. And we say it often because it's so true. What God demands 
God provides. What God demands, God provides. It's been there in the Bible all the way through. We were talking in Sunday school this morning. It's even there in the law. God demands in that law, that moral law, those Ten Commandments. But knowing that men would never be able and women would never be able to keep those commandments, God provided the sacrificial system by which they could be saved by looking forward to the person of Jesus Christ. So Jesus in this passage is introducing his audience to a heavenly father that was beyond the imagination of anyone in that culture and in that time. And frankly, it's a little bit beyond the imagination of most of us as well. And if I could do any one thing, I would, I would try and pour into your heart and into, mind, into mine what it means to be loved by God. I don't, think we, I don't think we even begin to understand how much God really loves us. And Jesus is trying to teach that there. And so in this passage, as we've looked already at the prodigal son and what he means with regard to repentance and return to God, we're now looking at the God the Father, and we said there are eight things that God does here, that the Father does, that represent what God the Father does for us. And we've looked at five of those, seen that God lets us go. He gives us the freedom to move out and to live as though God didn't matter in the hope that the things he brings into our life to point us toward him will cause us to begin to come to the realization that God is all that matters on our own. Secondly, God longs for our return. God longs for our return. He is not willing that any should perish. So that's the heart of God. He will not force us. He will not make us do something that we do not will to do, but God longs for our return. Thirdly, God absorbs our shame. This shows his mercy. The shame that belongs to us as a result of the sin that is part of our life, God took on him in the person of Jesus Christ on the cross, and he has absorbed that on our behalf. We need never be ashamed. We need never go back to our past and castigate ourselves or allow someone else to do that if we've come to God for forgiveness. Fourthly, he lavishes us with love. I don't know, we could talk all day about that, but let me just give you one phrase that I hope you'll, you'll keep in mind. God loves us not for what he finds in us. There is nothing in us that would deserve the love of God. But God loves us not for what he finds in us, but for what he finds in himself. And that is good news. He loves us because he chooses to love us. And then fifthly, God cleans us up. He forgives us. A forgiveness that we could never earn on our own has been given to us freely by, by the Father when we come and ask him. And so that leads us up to the three great things we want to look at this morning. And these are three fantastic doctrines of the Christian faith. They're at the foundation of everything that we believe and that we hold. And if I could only communicate them clearly, but since I can, I'm praying that the Holy Spirit will, that you will grasp these perhaps as never before this morning. Number six in our list, God pays our price. God pays our price. This is the great teaching in the Bible of atonement. The first thing we need to understand about this is that forgiveness always comes with a price. I think we have sort of in our mind, we forgive someone and we can forgive freely and so why can't God forgive freely? But we forget that all forgiveness, any kind of forgiveness always costs somebody something. So you smash into my car and ruin it, right? What has to happen? If I forgive you, one of two things has to happen. Either you fix my car and it costs you, or I fix my car and it costs me, or I leave my car in that mess that you've created, but, either, but, but now I suffer the loss, but there's a cost to be paid if I forgive you. Somebody insults me, and I choose to forgive them, which certainly I should, but there's now an emotional cost. It's not a physical cost, right? There's not money involved now, but there's an emotional cost that I have to pay to accept the shame that attached to that insult. Or if that person comes and asks forgiveness, they pay a price, an emotional price to admit that they were wrong and to acknowledge it. But there's always a cost. Forgiveness always comes at a price. So the question is, where is the price in this 
parable. Where's the cost? Islam says that there is no cost attached to this parable, that the boy simply comes and he is forgiven without any savior involved in the process. He decides to return home. The father decides for whatever reason that he will forgive him. And so there is forgiveness, but there's no cross. There's no suffering. There's no payment. There is no savior. There's just forgiveness based on nothing. Forgiveness is God's prerogative if he chooses, chooses to forgive. And maybe if you're good enough, maybe he will, maybe he won't. But there's no incarnation. There's no God becoming one with man. There's no price to be paid for forgiveness. But Dr. Kenneth Bailey, who uh, has spent most of his adult life, most of his life, in fact, in the Middle East, and has studied hard there, says, no, no, there's a price here. It's all here. It's maybe a little bit subtle. It's not the main point of the parable. But there is clearly a price here. Two ways, at least, that he says we can see the cost of forgiveness. Number one is what we talked about last week, how the father goes running to the son. He, he's running out there like a teenager. He's exposing his legs, which was forbidden in that culture. He is, he's running to the son because he is now what? Identifying with his son. Think of it this way. This is like an incarnation. This is the same thing that Jesus Christ does for us in becoming one with us to absorb our shame. So the father runs to the son and he takes upon himself much of the humiliation and the mockery and so on that belong to the son. There's a price that he's paying. There's further a price in the fact that he gives the son new sandals, a new robe. He gives him a ring. He gives him a party. There's a great celebration. And everything that this young son is going to have from this day forward as a son in this family is going to be what? Paid for by someone else. The price is going to be paid by the father and it's going to be paid by the elder brother out of their share of the inheritance because this young man has totally squandered his share. So everything he gets from this day forward is going to be paid for by someone else. The father is going to pay willingly. The elder brother here is paying out of a sense of compulsion. But beloved, not our elder brother brother. He pays our price, but not because he thinks he has to. Our elder brother is Jesus Christ, and he pays the price for our sin willingly. He takes our shame, and he pays the penalty for us on the cross. What does Peter say in 1 Peter 2, verse 24? He says, he himself bore our sins in his body, on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness by his wounds. You have been healed. It's not our merit, but his wounds. It's not our works, but his death. It's not our payment. Not our doing penance of some kind, but his payment that has made the difference. Our elder brother has paid the price for us to become part of the family. This is theological term is substitutionary atonement. It's the most wonderful truth in the Bible. God has been, has sent the substitute for you and me so that we could have life. Tim Keller tells a, a, a great story. I don't know where he came across it, but two Chinese young men came to San Francisco in the early days of the 20th century. One of them, the younger one, was tended to be quite rebellious by nature and eventually he got himself into all kinds of trouble. He got in with the wrong crowd, got running around with gamblers and people like that and was in a poker game one night and in the midst of some argument, great argument, he pulled out a knife that he happened to have with him, knifed a man to death, ran home, all bloody everywhere in his clothing and everything else. He ran into his house, he changed his clothes, he, he tried to hide the uh, bloody clothes and then he left. His elder brother who was there saw everything that was going on, got the quick story, but the younger brother wasn't sticking around. He was gone. The elder brother now realized the police are going to be here any minute. I have no time to dispose of these clothes or anything else. So we, what he did was he put them on. When the police came, they took one look at him. He was 
They were brothers. They looked alike physically. They arrested him. They took him away. They had a trial. He was found guilty and he was executed for the crime of murder that his brother had committed. Later, that younger brother found that his conscience was bothering him and he went back. He went to the police. He confessed the sin and, and said, I'm ready to take my punishment. And they said, too late. Punishment for this crime has already been paid. We can't do anything more. You're free to go. This is what Jesus Christ has done for us. Jesus Christ is the elder brother who has paid our price, who has taken our place, who has paid the penalty for our sin. Charges can never be brought against us. You're free to go. Romans 8.1, one, one of our memory verses, right? There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. The price has been paid. The elder brother has come and he's paid the price. You know, if you think about it, this parable, this parable is asking a great question and then answering it. The question it's asking is, how can a God who is in the words of Hebrews 12, 29, a consuming fire of holiness. His very character demands that he hate and that he judge and that he condemn every instance of sin. How can a God who is a holy fire of, a consuming fire of judgment against sin also be the loving, kind, gracious, heavenly Father that Jesus presents in this parable? How is it that those two can be together? And the answer is, what God demands, God provides. This, this is the answer to Romans, uh, Romans 3.26, where Paul says God is both, the, both just and the justifier of those who will come to faith in him. He doesn't lose his holy wrath against sin. But he takes upon himself the penalty for that so that anyone who will come to him can be freely and graciously forgiven and brought into the family of God. This is atonement. This is the great truth of this, of this passage. Number seven, seventh thing that God does for us. God dresses us up. God dresses us up. This is the great doctrine, the great teaching of imputation. Did you know, and please listen as I ask this question, did you know that being forgiven is not enough to get you into heaven? Did you know that? Being forgiven, being free of sins is not enough to get you into heaven. That's one side of a two-sided coin. On this side is forgiveness of sin. But Jesus tells us on the other side, there's another requirement. He tells us in one passage that our righteousness must be greater than the righteousness of the Pharisees, who were the greatest and most righteous people that that people in first century Palestine knew. And then so that we get the picture completely, he says in, in Matthew 5, 48, he says, you must be perfect as your Holy Father is perfect. So there's the standard. Not only must your righteousness be greater than that of the scribes and Pharisees, but you must be perfect, as a matter of fact. So you say, well, isn't forgiveness of sins doesn't mean that I am perfect? And the answer is no. Forgiveness of sin just means you don't have any sin. But on the other side of the coin, you don't have any righteousness either. You're like Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden before the fall. What were, they? what were they? They were people who were without sin. They had never sinned. So they were without sin, but they still were not qualified for heaven. Why? Because they had not yet been tested. They were innocent, but they were not perfect. You can't be perfect. You can't be righteous until you've met the test and show yourself positively to be righteous. So, how do I get righteousness? Verse 22 in our passage. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his finger and shoes on his feet. The father forgave him the sin. That was clear right from the very beginning, right? He welcomed him back. But then what did he do? He clothed him. This is a beautiful, perfect picture of 
imputation. Now, I know some of you are saying, impute what? <laughs> imputation. Imp what is imputation? Imputation means that we attribute something to someone that they have not earned and that they don't deserve. Imputation is crediting something to someone that they have no way of getting on their own. This is what the father is doing, giving this son clothing that he didn't deserve, that he, that he could never have earned back the privilege of having. And it's showing us how we get righteousness because unseen, at the moment we come to faith in Christ, not only are sins forgiven on the negative side, but the righteousness of Jesus Christ is given to us on the positive side. And if you don't have that, you don't have heaven. Thankfully, we do because God has covered us both ways here, but the imputation, the crediting of the righteousness of Christ to me as though I did what he did. It's amazing. This is the truth of 2 Corinthians 5.21. If you haven't picked up in the years you've been here, this is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. Uh, you probably haven't been listening, Right? He made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be what? The righteousness of God in him. My sins traded for his righteousness. What a deal. This is imputation. I get the righteousness of Christ. He gets my sin. Do you remember the baptism of Christ? And you may remember that John the Baptist looked at Jesus when Jesus came to him to be baptized because John's baptiz ba 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 baptizing is calling a baptism of repentance. Remember that? And John looks at Jesus and said, what are you doing here? I shouldn't be baptizing you. You should be baptizing me. And Jesus said to him, what? He said, well, John, now you're going to, be to baptize me because thus it, thus it becomes us to fulfill all righteousness. What in the world was he talking about? Here's what he was talking about. He was talking about if I'm going to provide righteousness for these people, first I have to identify with the sin of these people so that they can get my righteousness. And that's what the baptism of Jesus was all about. It was about him becoming one with us in our sin so that we could become one with him in his righteousness. Do you see it? This is imputation. This is us getting what we could never earn and what we don't deserve. But God freely gives it to us. The new clothing of imputation. It's, you know, if you picture it this way, the moment we come to faith in Christ, he removes all of the old rags and the rotten clothing of our own righteousness, just like the prodigal. And he replaces them with the perfection of Jesus Christ and it stays there forevermore. Forevermore, we are righteous in Christ. From a judicial standpoint, in the words of Paul in Philippians 3.9, he says, we are wearing the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Let me give you another picture of this. In Zechariah, Ze you say, Zechah who? Zechariah. Second to the last book in the Old Testament. That might help find it. Zechariah chapter 3. This is... About 400 years before Christ, they're building a new, new temple. They're trying, to get, they're trying to get things squared away after they've been away in captivity to get their society reset, to get everything reset the way it should be, and including the priesthood needs to be cleansed. And so in Zechariah 3, we have this comments that are made there by Zechariah. He says, then God... And starting in verse 1, Zechariah 3, 1, he says, Then God showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. Where do you see that? All the way through the Bible, Revelation 12 in particular. What does he say Satan is doing? Constantly accusing the brethren. Here's an Old Testament picture of it. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, O Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this a brand plucked from the fire? In other words, this is one I've chosen. Now Joshua was standing before the angel clothed in filthy garments. How can God say I've chosen him? The word filthy is a mild word here. That's not what it really says in the Hebrew. He's standing there in garments of human filth. And the angel said to those who were standing before him, remove the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you. And that's the negative side, the forgiveness of sin. And... 
I will clothe you in pure vestments. Do you see what imputation is? This is the Old Testament picture of the righteousness of Christ being applied to a person who doesn't deserve it, couldn't earn it, could never get this on his own, but he is given what he could not do on his own. Now, let me ask you a question. So I have the righteousness of Christ. Does that mean I never sin again? No. Still going to sin again. I don't want to sin again. But I know I'm going to sin again. So what happens? Well, the Bible instructs believers in 1 John 1, 9, if you confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive your sin and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Well, that's a good thing to know. But now my question is, so what does that mean? Am I getting saved and unsaved and saved and unsaved and going back and forth? No, it doesn't mean that. Let me show you what it means. It means that as a child of God, as a part of the family, we need forgiveness. As God is judged, the issue is resolved. There's now, therefore, no condemnation ever to those who are in Christ Jesus. But as a family member, seeing God as Father... There's this ongoing need, because why? Because when you sin, when your kids sin, what happens? There's a little breach in the, in the family there for a little bit, right? Till we get things right. Same is true in the family of God. Let me show you this in, in John 13. Just, just turn there quickly. John 13, this is the night before Jesus is gonna die. And Jesus, you recall, humil- humbles himself to wash the feet of the disciples because they've come into this upper room. There's no servant there as there normally would be at at a home. And the disciples who have been arguing about who is the greatest before they get to this point, according to Luke's gospel, are not by any means washing anybody's feet. That's the last thing on their mind. So Jesus strips himself to the clothing of a slave and begins to wash their feet. So we have this, this great illustration that he gives us. And and let's start in verse 8. As he's washing their feet, Peter is appalled at this when he sees what's going on. Now, what's interesting to me is Peter doesn't volunteer to say, hey, Lord, step aside. I'll take care of this. He doesn't do that. He hasn't reached the the mind of a servant yet. He'll get there, but he's not there yet. But he just says says this in verse 8, John 13 and verse 8. Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus said to him, if I do not wash you, Peter, you have no share with me. So Simon Peter said to him, well, Lord, if that's true, not only my feet, but my hands and my head, wash me all over. I certainly want to be part of you. But then Jesus said to him, the one who is bathed does not need to wash except his feet, but is completely clean. What's Jesus saying there? You as a believer, Peter, are, you're saved. Your sin is forgiven. But you occasionally need to get your feet washed so that the relationship with the Father is the joyous, loving relationship that it's intended to be. That's what 1 John 1, 9 is all about. Believer confessing their sins so that the joy of the family relationship with the Father is restored. It's not to get us saved from condemnation, but it's to get us to enjoy again the relationship with the family. Do you see? So that's what... That's what this is all about. But the big question is settled. The imputation has settled that. I am living with the clothing of the righteousness of Christ on me. John Stott says this in a beautiful way. Listen to this quote. He says, for the essence of sin, the essence of sin is man substituting himself for God. Well, the essence of salvation is God substituting himself for man. Man asserts himself against God and puts himself where only God deserves to be. God sacrifices himself for man and puts himself where only man deserves to be. Man claims prerogatives that belong to God alone. God accepts penalties that belong to man alone. That is imputation. And that's what we have in Christ. The Father This is the Father that Jesus is depicting here, that he wants us to understand, that he wants us to see how much he loves us. You know, Groucho Marx, you remember the old, some of you are too too young, but some of you will remember. Groucho Marx, the old comedian, he hated cliches. 
So he got a letter from his bank one time that says, you know, typical cliche at the end of the letter. It says, if we can ever be of any service to you, please call on me. So he wrote a letter back. He said, dear sir, the best thing you can do to be of service to me is to borrow some money from the account of one of your richer clients and credit it to mine. If you really want to be of service, why don't you do that? But you see, that's exactly what Jesus has done for us. God has taken from the account of his dear son. He's taken the perfections that belong to him alone and he's credited it to our account. He's removed all the self-righteous, self-centered, self-promoting things that are constantly a part of our life. He's removed them and he's put in their place the perfections of Jesus Christ. So that every word and every thought and every deed that Jesus did is what God the Father sees when he looks at us as judge. I'm not saying he doesn't see the sin that you do on a daily basis. He does, but you can never be condemned for it in Christ. He sees the righteousness of Christ. This is imputation. Every right thing that Jesus ever did imputed to you. Can you get your hands around that? This is what the hymn writer meant when he said, when he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found. Faultless, clothed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before his throne. On Christ, the solid rock I stand, all other ground, sinking sand. That's why you need not just the forgiveness of sins, but you need the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Imputation. Final thing here. Watch this. It's like we just go from one treasure to another, right? Here's the, here's the final one. God takes us in. God takes us in. This is adoption. Adoption. The son comes back and he's received back into sonship, but now it's not just an outward relationship that was meaningless to him before. So meaningless he was willing to trample it into the ground. Now he is going to be inwardly the son of this father. And in this he represents what God the father does for us, taking us into his family, adopting us, making us part of who he is. This is incredible. We see this all the way through this parable. Now if you're back in Luke Back in uh, Luke 15, watch beginning in verse 22. Luke 15, beginning in verse 22. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe. Literally that reads a robe, comma, the foremost one. This is the robe that the father would have had as a special occasion robe that he would have been wearing to the celebration later in the day when he's going to celebrate and have a party for his son. And instead he gives it to the son. The foremost robe. Put it on him. And put a ring on his hand. The ring is the signet ring of the father. It signifies his, his authority. Everything that he did, every transaction he made would have been sealed with that ring in the, in, the, in the hot wax. It would have been used in those days to signify authority. And with that ring, the son has now inherited all of the rights and privileges of sonship. Put shoes on his feet. Remember the old Negro spiritual, Right? All God's children got shoes. Why was that important? Because slaves didn't have shoes. Only family had shoes. And so when the father is saying, I want you to take the sandals and I want you to put that on him, he's saying, this is something that will show him to be my son, not my slave. Not what he was saying, he wanted to come back and, and, be, and be my slave. No, no, he's a son. He's wearing shoes. Then I want you to bring the fattened calf, not just any calf, the fattened calf, the fattened, the fattened calf. The word the is there in the original, the fattened calf. What's that? That's the calf that's saved for special occasions, for the feasts, for the weddings, for whatever the special time is going to be. That calf that we've been saving, that calf that could feed 200 people, I want you to bring that calf. I want you to kill him. Why? Because my son that was lost is back. This is adoption. This is sonship. 
This is the Father giving us a place that we could never imagine. What a picture of the Heavenly Father. Can you imagine this audience who never, ever thought of God in those terms? What are they thinking as Jesus shows this kind of Father being adopted? Listen, are you, are you a Christian today? Are you a believer? How did you get there? Listen to these passages of Scripture I'm going to read for you that tell you how you got there. Ephesians 1.5, he predestined us. Sorted out our future before we were ever born or thought of. In fact, he tells us he predestined us for adoption as sons of Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. How did that happen? Galatians 4.5, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as children. The result of all this, Romans 8, 15 to 16, for you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father, Daddy. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Adoption. Here's maybe the best one of all, Hebrews 2.11. For he who sanctifies, Je that is Jesus, and those who are sanctified, that's us, all have one source, that's God the Father. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers. <laughs> brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ himself. Have you ever do you think of yourself in those terms? Do you know who you are in Christ? Do you think you have to work to be loved? Trying to save yourself? You've already been saved. You have a Savior. You have, a, you have an elder brother who's done everything that can be done for your adoption. What a special relationship with the Father this implies. J.I. Packer wrote a book called Knowing God. It's one of the, one of the, one of the best books of the 20th century. He says this, he says, what is a Christian? The question can be answered in many ways, but the richest answer that I know is that a Christian is one who has God as Father. Our understanding of Christianity cannot be better than our grasp of adoption. The truth of our adoption gives us the deepest insights that the New Testament offers into the greatness of God's love. Where I asked to focus the New Testament message in three words, my proposal would be adoption through propitiation. Sounds like a theologian, right? But propitiation means what? The satisfaction of a, of a God who has a rightful wrath against sin and that, that wrath being satisfied by the substitution of Jesus Christ. So it's the atonement we just talked about. What's the greatest message in the New Testament? I'm adopted by his atonement by paying for my penalty. How special is adoption? Can you imagine God? I mean, can you just, just try to imagine in your mind's eye that Jesus would suddenly just appear here today and he would say, I've been sent by God. I have been sent because I want you and I want you and I want you and I want you. I love you. I choose you. I want you. I bring you into the family of God. That's what he's done. This is the message that Jesus is giving here. Let me conclude this way. Jesus has shown that the Father provides atonement for sin. Jesus has shown that the Father clothes us in the righteousness of the perfection of his own Son. And Jesus has shown us that the Father throws a monstrous party to welcome us into the family. He has shown us the rejoicing of God over every sinner who comes to repentance. Not because we deserve it, not because we, like Oprah, can somehow go earn it, but, be, but for the simple reason that he chose us before the foundation of the world in Ephesians 1.4. Doesn't get any better than that. David Platt, some of you have read this book, if you were in the small groups or maybe some other time, but the book Radical, do you remember the illustration he used in there? Actually, I think this is, I've got to take that back. It's in his book, uh, Follow Me, which is a follow-on to Radical. He, he tells how he plays a game. 
with his son or used to when the boy was little. He would see his son across the room and he'd holler out, I love Caleb. And the boy would look and he would see his dad and he says, I love daddy. And they would laugh and they would play this game. Well, one day Caleb's getting a little older and he stops and he says, I love daddy. And then he stops and he says, and his smile goes off his face and he says, daddy, do you really love me? His dad says, well, yes, Caleb, I really love you. And then he asked that famous question all kids ask eventually, well, why? And David Platt says, well, because you're my son. And so then he follows up with another question, well, why? Now Platt is thinking about life, right? And he's thinking how he and his wife, Heather, tried to have children and couldn't have children. He's thinking about all that they went through to think about the possibility of adoption and finally make that decision. And then he's thinking about how they interfaced with the people in Kazakhstan to find out about a child, children that would be over there without parents and how they finally went, how they walked into this, into this place to choose this little boy out of all the little boys that were there. By this time, of course, he's, he's crying. So he says to his son, well, Caleb, I love you because I love you. I chose you. I went and got you because I wanted you to have a mom and dad. This is our Heavenly Father. Dear friends, this is, this is what Jesus is all about. We can't fix the Niagara Falls of our own faults and our own sins, but Jesus can. And he came to seek and to save that which is lost. He came to take our place. He came to pay our price. If we will just choose him, doesn't it take your breath away to hear God say, I love you, I choose you, I want you? And we ask, why? And he says, because you're my child. And we say, why would you want me? You know my past. Why would you ever want me? Because I chose you for the foundation of the world. Because I love you enough to send my son to die for your sins and to pay your price. That's why. Just because. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that what you demand, you supply. We would have no other hope if it were not for that. At the end of the day, Father, uh, you've done all you can possibly do. The human side of this is that we have a responsibility to say yes to you, to look to you. Look to me, you say in Isaiah, and be saved all the ends of the earth. And so we need only look at you and the salvation is available. If there's anyone here that has not received you, and I know there are some, would you please cause them right now today, Lord, cause their heart to reach out to you, cause them to take you as Savior and as Lord. Cause them to say, I'm ready to be adopted. I want to be part of that family. Help them to realize that's available. Not, you, you can't accomplish this. There's nothing you can do to earn this love. It's just there. So would you help us to do that? Make it the prayer of our heart as we sing together this closing hymn. I pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ who loved us so much. Amen.